Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to Indian Trail Presbyterian Church's virtual worship service this week. Uh, we welcome you however you're joining us and we thank God for bringing us together as God's people, especially on this first Sunday of Advent. This is the season when we prepare ourselves to celebrate uh, Christ coming into the world, born in Bethlehem, which we celebrate at Christmas, but also to look forward to Christ coming again to bring God's kingdom in all of its fullness. Uh, a couple of announcements. I want to say thank you to Presbyterian Women for the work they've done to prepare our sanctuary, our worship space for the Advent and Christmas seasons. And I also want to remind you that next week is the first Sunday of the month, and so we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, communion together. And if you're worshiping with us on YouTube, we invite you to prepare some bread or and some wine or juice in your own home and celebrate that sacrament with us as we worship virtually. Well, as I said, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and so we will in our YouTube worship services, like we will in our uh, in-person worship services, we will be lighting candles each Sunday to remind us of the weight we are on and the progress we are making toward the Christmas celebration. And so on this first Sunday of Advent, we recall Mark's good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was baptized by John, on whom the Spirit descended like a dove, and of whom the voice from heaven said, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. We remember, too, our own baptism, the beginning of our participation in the work of Christ's kingdom. And on this first Sunday of Advent, we light a candle of hope. A candle of hope for all that the coming of Christ into our world initiates. Forgiveness, love, peace, new life today, and fullness of life in the coming kingdom of God forever. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us worship God. Let us pray together. Holy God, as we gather to worship this day, we ask your blessing upon us. Jesus talks about worshiping in spirit and in truth in John's gospel. May we do just that. Not in our own spirit, but in your spirit, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, which settles us, opens us to your word, transforms us, renews us, and moves us toward your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, who doesn't love a good mystery? Whether it's a book or a movie or a television series, maybe even following uh, a mysterious news story, on the evening news or on your computer who doesn't love a good mystery we're gonna we're gonna see a mystery or talk about a mystery today in our worship in our sermon and and scripture uh, but first I want to say a word about this worship series during the Advent season um, you probably know that in the Advent season we who are people of God we Christians we tend to be looking in two directions at once we sort of need to have our heads on swivels because in the one sense, we're looking backwards as we prepare to celebrate God coming into our world in Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem. We will celebrate that at Christmas. And in these four weeks that lead up to that celebration, we're looking backwards in history to get ready for that celebration. But at the same time, Advent calls us unequivocally to, to always be looking forward as well, looking forward with anticipation to, to Christ coming again, to 
God coming in, in, in the fullness of time to bring God's kingdom in its fullness to make all things new. Advent is a time that emphasizes our waiting for that promised coming in the future. So we're looking in two directions at one time. Well, as we were, um, as I was talking with some of our elders about the Advent uh, worship season and how what we might emphasize during this worship season, uh, one of them mentioned the fact that uh, so often we take the Advent uh, scriptures and the Christmas scriptures and we kind of throw them all in a bowl and and mix them up and and uh, we come out with one big story, which is which is fine. We need to take the whole of scripture. At the same time, however. It is important to kind of look at each gospel distinctively, separately, to see what is unique about that gospel and how it, how Mark or Matthew or Luke or John, how they individually tell the story of both Jesus coming in the past, but also how they look forward to Christ coming again, to see if we have uh, distinct messages and lessons to learn from each of those four Gospels separately, um, always, of course, holding them in tension and together with one another. Um, so we decided that we would look each Sunday of Advent at one of the Gospels and ask the question, um, how does this particular go Gospel uh, look distinctively back at the coming of Christ and distinctively forward to Christ coming again? And so today we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Mark. We're going to start with Mark, and this may be the simplest of the sermons I have to write because it's fairly obvious um, what a primary distinction is between Mark, uh, among Mark, between Mark and the other other Gospels. And we're going to look at that and just begin looking at that in just a moment. There are some real distinctions. So the first question we want to ask is: How does Mark distinctively look backwards? To the coming of Jesus. And so for that, we'll turn to the first chapter of Mark, uh, the first 13 verses of Mark's gospel. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. Uh, listen now for God's word. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, and just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Those are the first 13 verses of Mark's gospel. This is how Mark introduces Jesus to the reader and to us as we read it today. What do you notice? There's no birth at all. No birth narrative at all. Suddenly, distinctively, Jesus just appears as an adult to be baptized by John. Suddenly, without any word about where this man came from, in the very first line, this is the amazing part, in the very first line of his gospel, Mark identifies Jesus as the Messiah. The people of God for generations 
uh, since before the time of the prophets had been waiting on the Messiah. They knew that God would come and intervene in history and that God would make all things new. And they prayed for this and they waited for this. The Messiah was a loaded word. Everybody knew what that meant. And in the very first line, Mark says, here is the Messiah, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. That word Christ is the Greek word for Messiah. And so the first people to hear these words read, the first people to read these words immediately in the very first line would have been introduced to the Messiah in a startling, jarring way with no word, no explanation about where he came from. Nothing about the birth of Jesus in Mark's gospel. Nothing about where he came from in these first lines. It's all mysterious. One of my sons in middle school or his early teen years used to read a series of books uh, that was, it was it, they were young adult novels based in Greek and Roman mythology written by a man named Rick Rorden. And I, I picked up a few of them and read them along the way because they were about on my level. But, uh, but one of the things I loved about Rick Rorden's books was the first line of his book was always catchy. It always grabbed you and made you want to want to read on and read more. Um, I remember one that I couldn't find it when I looked for it today, but um, this morning, but, uh, but, but I remember one that um, started out something like, I didn't mean to set the school gym on fire during my summer vacation. And then it went on. It grabs you. Mark, in this, in his opening words, grabs the reader so that the reader can't wait to hear the rest of the story. This is the Messiah. He does it in a few different ways, um, three of which I'll mention. First of all, that, that first line, the word Christ, Messiah. He, later on in a few verses, you heard him say that, that John told the people, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a sign of the presence of the God of all creation. And then finally, when he talks about the, the heavens being torn apart as, the, as Jesus was baptized and the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove, again, the people would have, would have heard immediately that this was a coded language for the coming of God into the world, the, the coming of the Messiah, the intervening of God in history. We may not hear that the same way that they did with such jarring um, effect because we've heard these words so many times and we were not part of that culture. Um, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, this is a silly example, but um, if I said to you, uh, there, was, there was a ram clad in sky blue who traveled from the valley of the sun with the pigskin to the chapel on the hill. Some of you immediately figure out that I'm talking about the quarterback of the Carolina Tar Heels, Sam Howe, who, who played his high school ball here at Indian Trail at Sun Valley High School. Um, I didn't say his name. I didn't say anything about Tar Heels or Carolina, but you knew if you're a sports fan in North Carolina, you knew exactly who I was talking about. It was, I used that coded language of sky blue and the ram and the pigskin and the chapel on the hill. Uh, you knew there was no, there's no doubt in your mind what I was talking about. There would have been no doubt in the people's minds that Mark is introducing to them the Messiah. In Mark, Jesus comes decidedly and suddenly as the Messiah. And it's all so mysterious. It's a mystery because there's no word about where he came from. There's nothing about his origin, no birth narrative what so all. Now, it's not that the Messiah, Jesus as the Messiah is not integral to the story of the other Gospels. It's just that in the absence of a birth narrative, it's all the more jarring in Mark's Gospel. It's a mystery. So that's how Mark looks back in a very distinctive way at the first coming of Jesus. How does Mark look forward to the promise of Christ coming again. Well, it is also distinctive, and you might have already guessed, it is also quite mysterious. Let's read now from the 16th chapter of Mark's Gospel. This is the last chapter of Mark's Gospel. Um, this is the narrative after Jesus has been arrested and crucified. 
uh, and after he's been uh, put in the tomb, and this is the story of the, the resurrection day, uh, the first day of the week when the tomb was down empty. Now, I want to say to you that I'm going to read only the first eight verses of chapter 16 because most scholars agree that this was the original ending to Mark's gospel, that Mark's gospel ends at, at verse 8, and as you will see, it's a, a, so jarring of an end that, um, that scholars, uh, that, 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 that biblical writers later came back and, and added a more uh, a, a fuller ending to Mark's gospel based on what they knew from the other uh, gospels, from the other witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Uh, but Mark's gospel doesn't, uh, well, it, you'll see, it ends very abruptly. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint the body of Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us and, uh, from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look. There's the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out, and this is the very last verse of the original ending. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. You can see why this was troubling to later Christians and they felt like they needed to go in and, and kind of sum things up based on what they knew from other witnesses to the resurrection. But Mark's gospel just ends so suddenly and so jarringly. There's no proclamation. If this were all we had, if this was the only story we had, we wouldn't know what happened. I mean, we'd have that mysterious Angels were that he was raised, but we wouldn't know any of the rest of the story because we're told the women were so terrified that they said nothing to anyone. They didn't tell the news, at least not immediately and at least not as Mark originally told the story. It's left, there's no resurrection appearance of Jesus at all. It's left completely open-ended. It leaves the reader wondering what, what happened. What will happen? What's going to happen? There's all this expectation of what this means. And it feeds right into another part of Mark's gospel earlier on in chapter 13 where, where Jesus, foretelling the end, said, warn the disciples, you've got to be aware, you've got to be awake, you keep awake, stay alert. And watch and wait. And that's how Mark's gospel leaves us, expecting, waiting, wondering, what does it mean? What will it mean? It's all very, very mysterious. Again, it's not that waiting and expectation is not part of the other gospels. It's just that Mark does it in such a way, in the absence of any proclamation, any spreading of the good news, Mark does it in such a way that just leaves us hanging on the edge of our seats. A cliffhanger, if you will. A mystery. In one congregation I served, um, we did a series of, of Bible studies on, uh, uh, through the Bible Bible studies, and, and, and I sort of developed a habit of, of when a question came up that was not easy to answer, um, I would often start out my response with something like, well, first of all, let's, let's just acknowledge that this is mysterious. It's a great mystery. You know, we really can't fully answer this question. Uh, but having said that, here's what we can say about it. And then I'd go on and we'd have a discussion. And I, I guess I did this so often, it kind of became a joke 
uh, among some of the folks, and I, I didn't know they were joking about that behind my back. But then one night in Bible study, I um, I uh, a question was asked, and 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 actually the 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 woman who asked it said, well, well, first of all, um, I just want you to know, I know this is a mystery. Now that we got that out of the way, and then she went on to ask her question, and everybody laughed. Uh, when I when I when that Bible study finished, they presented me with a, a little cross stitch. A uh, piece of uh, in, in a frame that said that quoted one of the passages of scripture great is the mystery of our faith but our faith is mysterious Paul says when he's trying to explain the resurrection let me tell you a mystery in other words I'm admitting Paul says I can't really explain this it's a mystery but let me tell you what I think or what I know our faith is mysterious Mark's storytelling amplifies the mystery of our faith. We need to hold on to mystery in our faith. Uh, Paul in another place says, now we only see dimly in a mirror dimly, but then we shall know fully. But now it is a great mystery. So much of what God promises, the expectation of Christ coming again, bringing the kingdom in all its fullness. It is quite mysterious. And so let us hold on to that mystery as Mark's gospel encourages us to do. The mystery of our faith, the mystery of God suddenly intervening, breaking into our world in Jesus, the mystery of Christ healing, not just healing physical bodies, but, but, but healing the mission of the disciples, healing the perspective of people's minds, healing our systems in our broken world. The mystery of forgiveness that is so often undeserved. The mystery of the anticipation of Christ's coming kingdom. Of Christ coming in the clouds, as Mark says in the first chapter. The mystery of the promise of a kingdom in which all things will be made new and for which we wait. Come, Lord Jesus, in all your mystery. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we turn now to God in prayer, I want to um, use as our prayer this week um, a prayer by Dr. Christine Roy Yoder, who is a professor at Columbia Theological Seminary. Um, in an email, uh, this afternoon or Sunday afternoon, you will get a, a link uh, to a, an Advent journal published by Columbia Theological Seminary that you can either use uh, on your uh, computer or tablet or you can print out on your printer. Um, but this is one of the prayers, the prayer for this first week of Advent from that Advent resource from Columbia Theological Seminary. Let us pray together. We've been waiting for a long time, oh God. Waiting for vaccines to be available for everyone everywhere. Waiting together without counting and distancing and masking. Waiting to have to worry less about so many things. Waiting for good news, any good news. Some wait this day for a phone call, a diagnosis, a cure. Some wait for a job, a meal, a home, a loved one. Some wait for the words to come, the seed to sprout, the fighting to end, the pain to ease. Some wait for courage, some wait for justice, some wait for safety, some wait when they should not wait. Bless our waiting, O oh God, waiting that in these days is so heavy and weary and spent, 
Bless our waiting and open in us the waiting of this holy season, our waiting for you. Waiting with roots in your sure promises of old, your words that never pass away. The days are surely coming, says the scripture. Waiting that stays awake and wonders and listens and learns. Waiting that hopes, loves, prepares, and hangs on as the world shakes and terrors roar. Waiting that stands up, helps up, lifts up, and looks up for your light, the true light coming into the world. Bless our Advent waiting, O God. We pray in the name of the one who came to us and a child born in Bethlehem and who promises to come again and who taught us to pray in the meantime. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we leave this time of worship, I want to echo some of the encouragement of that prayer we just prayed together. As we leave this time of worship, stay awake, wonder, listen, love, hope, prepare, hang on as the world shakes and terrors roar, stand up, help up, lift up, and look up to the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.